The Tom Woods Show, episode 836. Prepare to set fire to the index card of allowable opinion. Your daily dose of liberty education starts here. The Tom Woods Show. Folks, if you are in the market to become a gun owner or to expand your collection, let me recommend to you Osceola Arms, run by my friend and neighbor, Manuel Laura. I guarantee you he'll give you an excellent experience and he'll give you a cut rate on the shipping if you mention that you're a Tom Woods Show listener. Check it out at tomwoods.com slash arms. Hey, everybody, if you love to read, and I know you do, I've got some excellent libertarian ebooks for you that are absolutely free and that will help you make the case more effectively. Check them out at tomsfreebooks.com. Hey, everybody, Tom Woods here. Very glad to be joined by my old friend Dick Clark today. I got to know Dick when he was at the Mises Institute years ago. Back when I was a scholar in residence there, we had many a lunch together. He's now a firearms lawyer in Nebraska. He has other areas of specialty, but that's the one we're going to focus on today. And there are a number of issues related to guns, some of them related to current events and legislation and proposals that are floating around right now. And I thought, let's talk about some of these with a guy who really knows the subject inside and out as a gun owner and also as an advocate of guns uh, in his own private practice. Dick, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me, Tom. We have serious things to discuss, but before we get into serious things, look, I got to deal with the elephant in the room here. Your name is Dick Clark. Now, that's true. You used to go by Richard, so I know it wasn't by accident that you chose to go by Dick Clark. Is the story, is it really the case that you began to go by Dick Clark? I'm trying to remember back 10 years ago when we used to have lunch together that the story was you were at a bar and it was New Year's Eve or something and you were betting the bartender a drink if you could <laughs> prove that your name was Dick Clark. And then from that point on, you realized, hey, it's actually kind of cool to be Dick Clark. Did, did I imagine that or is that the truth? Well, I, I think there might be a little innovation on your part in that story. <laughs> oh, too uh, bad, because I wish that. Know, why don't we retroactively make that the reality? <laughs> you know, what I used to say is, you know, one of the fringe benefits of being named Dick Clark is I could never pay for my own drink on New Year's. And so I, that, I can see how that could have converted into this story. You know, the answer is my grandfather was Dick Clark. My dad is Dick Clark. And when I ended up in the freshman dorm in Auburn, uh, a kid across the hall from me figured out, hey, this guy, Richard Clark, I could call him Dick Clark. And it turned out the critical mass for a name change was about 310 folks. Once 310 folks in your immediate vicinity calling you, you know, start calling you something new, you really have no choice but to acquiesce. And so that's what happened to me. Uh, and I started going by Dick Clark, but that's that's not all bad. People remember the name a little easier that way, I guess. OK. All right. Well, fair enough. I just <laughs> had, to, I had to bring that up. All right. Let's let's talk about, you know, you also talk about serious things. Let's talk about some of the serious things. Sure. Uh, first of all, you you moved to Nebraska some years ago, and I guess that's where you're still living. That's right. Lincoln, Nebraska. And you did some public policy work there. Yeah, I was a policy advisor to Governor Heineman for several years, and I've worked uh, for some nonprofits like the Platt Institute for Economic Research, uh, Creighton University's Institute for Economic Inquiry. So I'm, I'm a little bit of a, a public policy and economic policy nerd, I guess you could say. Well, and I know that you were therefore keeping up with various trends at the state level and where different issues were going. And I thought, well, combine that with your knowledge of guns, and you seem to be a natural person to talk about this, just because there are some questions that I've had as a non-gun guy. Now, I don't mean I don't have a gun. I don't mean that I'm against them or whatever, but I'm not right. knowledgeable about them. I'm just not knowledgeable about them. I I'm starting to know more, but I have a feeling that there are others like me, and they feel like it would be emasculating if they admitted to this. <laughs> so I'm going to take one for the team here and, and ask some of my uh, elementary questions. First of all, start off by telling us what it is that you do today. Uh, you're in private practice, but you specialize in a particular kind of case. Sure. Well, I'm an attorney uh, in a solo law practice, and primarily I'm helping gun owners. I'm helping uh, gun dealers, manufacturers. And the, the gist of it is I'm trying to help everybody navigate the very complex federal, state, and local laws that apply in this area. Uh, I help a lot of individual gun owners do their estate planning because transferring a gun to, to junior after dad's death is a little more complicated 
interested in transferring the couch out of the living room to Junior after dad's death. And we want to make sure that people don't get tripped up by this sort of maze of laws and regulations that may apply uh, and that that valuable asset stays in the family, you know, gets where it's supposed to go. So that's a lot of what I do. Uh, and then I also help folks get their civil rights restored. If they've run afoul of some law and some years later have demonstrated that, hey, they're uh, law abiding now and they want to prove it, they want to get those rights back. I help folks apply for pardons and set asides and uh, other means of what we call post-conviction relief. So that's that's a lot of what I do. Wow. Okay. And so you're doing, of course, all cases in, in Nebraska. Where, what's your local area? Yeah. So I you know, I'm admitted to practice uh, in uh, one of your favorite states, Massachusetts, although I'm really inactive there. But that's where I went to law school, so I was licensed there. Uh, just to serving a clientele here in Nebraska. Occasionally, we'll consult with the attorneys in other states uh, helping with their clients. But yeah, really, really here in Nebraska, that's my focus. So, All right. Let, let's start with things that I know more about, and then we're going to proceed little by little to things I know less about. You've written to me some time ago when I was just in the throes of a horrifying project, and I wasn't wasn't able to get through Facebook messages, but you were writing to me about trends in the states that I followed a little bit because I'm interested in the Tenth Amendment and nullification. Right. About how states are pushing back against firearm regulations, but give me an example of this. And are these regulations really so onerous? Well, they sure can be. So, uh, you know, here in Nebraska, we're fighting what's called a preemption battle, which is an argument about which level of government ought to regulate these sorts of activities, activities relating to firearms. Uh, right now in Nebraska, in certain locales, say Lincoln, where I'm sitting right now, you can lose your firearms rights for some fairly trivial uh, events. For example, uh, the city of Lincoln says you're a prohibited person for purposes of firearms ownership and possession. Uh, if you have any number of, of misdemeanor, uh, you know, past offenses on your record, one of which might be anything to do with a weapons offense. So we had a gentleman named Kevin Williams here in Lincoln a few years ago who was raided by the police, had a very uh, extensive firearms collection taken from him by force because he once got a $90 ticket for having a pocket knife that was a quarter inch too long. And uh, because it was in his pocket, it was considered a concealed deadly weapon. Uh, and the city of Lincoln considered that a weapons violation such that they decided he couldn't have any right to have a weapon. Uh, now, thankfully, uh, some national organizations, nonprofits that are uh, you know advocates in this area uh, came in and supported the legal battle to uh, you know to get this guy's rights back, to get his property back as well. Uh, but just little minor things where you don't even have to necessarily appear in court for the violation that, uh, that you committed uh, can have very serious collateral consequences for your rights. Uh, and then, there, of course, there's a whole patchwork of regulations that may apply where some cities in Nebraska, for example, Omaha, may require registration of handguns to just legally possess that handgun in the city. They might uh, try to change whether or not you can openly carry a firearm. Uh, there are even some cities in Nebraska, like the city of Blair, that will uh, threaten you with arrest even as a concealed handgun permit holder and say, oh, well, you can only raise the fact that you're a permit holder as a defense once we've got you in criminal court. We may arrest you or charge you with a crime anyway, even though you have a permit to do the thing that you're doing. And so uh, a lot of people do not realize how extensive these local regulations can uh, can be and how, you know, in the modern era where lots of folks are driving an hour in a, in a car, right, you know, a miracle of modern capitalism that you can live, you know, 60 miles away from from your place of, uh, of uh, you know, where your uh, occupation is carried out. Uh you know, you could drive through all these different jurisdictions and just be totally oblivious to the fact that your fundamental natural right to keep and bear arms is sort of changing uh, as you're moving down the highway. Uh, and you might be subject to arrest for something at mile marker 25 that at mile marker 60 is totally legal. Uh, and, you know, in the state of Pennsylvania right now, they already have a very strong preemption law where the state preempts local regulation in this area. But a lot, of the, a lot of the local governments are just doing it anyway. Uh, and there's a great lawyer out there named Josh Prince who is suing their pants off right now uh, and to good effect knocking out these illegal local ordinances. But, you know, the folks who are against your gun rights uh, are fighting tooth and nail to hold on to these tools they have uh, to invade individual liberty. And we're having to having to beat them back the best we can. So. All right. Well, let's let's go back to the issue of the in particular, the state pushback against against this because what i've seen 
is mainly statements by states that, you know, if, if anything comes down further from the Obama administration, we're going to push back. Yes. So it's kind of like a hypothetical situation. It's not really a here is a specific thing and we are just not going along with it. Is there anything like that? Well, you know, there are a number of states that have passed nullification uh, bills uh, into law. Uh, Kansas, I think, is the most important example right now because there is active litigation uh, on a nullification case in Kansas. So one of the areas that I work on uh, relates to what we call National Firearms Act firearms. Uh, Right now, the hottest thing in that world are silencers, which are more heavily regulated under this federal gun control law that was passed back in 1934. But it also includes things like short-barreled rifles, short-barreled shotguns, a few other items. And in Kansas, they basically said, look, you can make one of these items, you can transfer one of these items, and as long as it is not sold interstate, as long as it's just intrastate commerce, we're asserting as the state of Kansas that that is not within the the purview of federal regulation, that that we are affirmatively telling you as the citizens of Kansas that that's legal in the state of Kansas. And so there is a uh, guy down in Kansas, his name escapes me right now, uh, but who made some silencers uh, relying on this state uh, promise of nullification of federal law and was prosecuted by the feds. And so uh, last I saw the Kansas attorney general is going to bat making the argument that, hey, feds, why do you have the right to invade the activities of our Kansans uh, and what they do with firearms just within our state of Kansas. Uh, And so that is a hot battle that's going on right now. We don't know what the outcome is going to be. Obviously, a lot of folks uh, on the progressive side of things want to just, you know, say the word supremacy clause and move on. Uh, Your book would provide uh, an argument in the opposite direction, but we'll have to wait and see how that fight goes in the federal courts. And, of course, Dick is referring to my book Nullification from 2010, so I'll link to that at tomwoods.com slash 836. Speaking of this show notes page, by the way, is it okay to link to your law practice website? Sure, yeah, dickclarklaw.com, or you can get there a little easier to remember uh, via silencerlawyer.com. So. Oh, <laughs> all right. Well, well <laughs> let's get to silencer in a minute, but as long as we're on state versus federal, let's talk about national reciprocity regarding sure. concealed carry. Now, is that in some way in opposition to the rights of individual states to make their own policies? How do you navigate that argument? And first of all, tell us what's act- what that is, what national reciprocity is. So national reciprocity, the core principle behind this idea is that, look, we have this right to keep and bear arms that's recognized by the U.S. Constitution, that's recognized by virtually all the state constitutions. Uh, Many states affirmatively grant a right via permit to carry concealed, and this is a right that should be more uniform throughout the U.S. If it's a fundamental right, then it should be recognized as such Uh, as long as we're traveling here in the same country that operates under the same constitution. Now, obviously, making that more uniform uh, creates a tension with the idea of state control over its own policy and the idea of what is the extent of the state police power, uh, you know, that sort of operates in opposition, you know, butts up against some of these constitutionally guaranteed rights uh, that are enumerated in the Bill of Rights, right? Uh, so the concern uh, that a lot of folks on our side of the aisle have, folks who, who believe in the individual right to keep and bear arms, uh, is that a national reciprocity law would create this new pressure for states to make their permitting process more restrictive in their state. The idea that, okay, in order to get reciprocity for our permit holders, now we've got to raise the bar so that it meets this minimum threshold for whatever the new federal standard would be for reciprocity. And I think that is a real concern uh, because in some states, uh, you don't have to have a permit to carry a firearm uh, concealed. In some states, the permit to get a firearm, uh, excuse me, a permit to carry a concealed firearm is really just a rubber stamp process. While in other states, like for example, where I live here in Nebraska, you have to do eight hours of training and you have to take a shooting test and you have to submit to a fingerprint based background check and have your picture taken and all the rest. And so the concern is if you're in a freer state where your permitting process is less onerous, 
that's a serious downside to a national reciprocity law, the idea that now there's this other policy pressure to get our otherwise pro-gun lawmakers in our pro-gun state to make this permit process tougher. I, to me, the solution is constitutional carry. The idea that states that are very pro-gun should back away from requiring any sort of permit to exercise this natural right of, of bearing a firearm, whether concealed or openly, but then they could have an optional permit to facilitate that reciprocity with other states. And we do see a major move in the states towards constitutional carry. It, it wasn't so long ago that there were two states that allowed it. And there were two states, maybe more likely than others, where you'd have to wear a parka, where, where a concealed carry might be the only practical way to carry a handgun. Alaska and Vermont were the two ones that allowed this permitless uh, concealed carry. Uh, now, just in the last few years, we see Arizona on the list, Arkansas on the list, Idaho on the list, Kansas, Maine, Missouri, uh We've got Mississippi. We've got uh, West Virginia, Wyoming. Uh, there are limited forms of constitutional carry in New Hampshire, Montana, uh, New Mexico, and Oklahoma. We have proposals being debated uh, even now as we speak uh, in Texas, Nebraska, and a number of other states. And uh, so I think that that might help mitigate some of the risk of the national reciprocity idea because now all of a sudden when you're talking about going to the grocery store in your home state, maybe that just wouldn't be relevant to you because a permit isn't required for that sort of concealed carry anyway. So a little bit of a sticky issue. I think that if we can get state legislators to take action to make their states freer in general, all of a sudden it becomes less of a problem when we're concerned about our gun rights uh, at the local level. So, All right. More to come after we thank our sponsor. I haven't done any polling on this, but I have a funny feeling there's a good number of you out there who have been meaning to invest in a gun and you haven't yet done it because it just seems like you don't know where to begin. You don't know anything about this. Well, I'm telling you, the place to go is Osceola Arms. How do I know that? Because it's run by my friend and neighbor, Manuel Laura, whom I've known for years. Manuel is a libertarian, so you're keeping the money in the family, so to speak. And forget about these gun broker and auction sites where half the time the shipping eats up the so-called savings that you're supposed to be getting. Manuel will give you a cut rate on the shipping if you tell them you're a Tom Woods Show listener. You can avoid paying sales tax if your purchase is transferred to a dealer out of Florida. We've already purchased from Manuel ourselves, and I now recommend him to you. Check him out at TomWoods.com arms. Like and share his Facebook page, and he'll enter you into special giveaways. There's no reason not to do this. You've been meaning to do it for so long. Now you've got the best guy in the universe you could possibly trust with this, Recommended by Tom Woods. Come on now. Check him out at TomWoods.com slash arms. When I asked you about your website, you said that there was another way to remember you, and that was silencerlawyer.com. And I just typed that in. Sure enough, it redirects to dickclarklaw.com. So let's talk about that because there's something that I don't know about. I didn't know about really until I was looking into having you on. The Hearing Protection Act. Apparently, this is in the news, and it's just gone completely over my head, or it's just gone, I haven't, I haven't uh, been aware of it. And it has something to do with the federal government making silencers more difficult to get. Can you lay this out? Sure. So there's a bill uh, that was just introduced, uh, H.R. 367, I believe, which is the Hearing, Protect uh, Hearing Protection Act of 2017. It's a revival of H.R. 3799 that was introduced in 2015. The idea is that the federal government has very onerous and burdensome restrictions on the making or transferring of silencers. And uh, it doesn't make much sense to have those restrictions. So uh, let's just get into a little bit of the background. In 1934, the Congress uh, passed the National Firearms Act in 1934, first major gun control legislation at the federal level. Okay, The, the act purported to target so-called gangster weapons. And remember, in the 1930s, the federal legislators didn't believe that they necessarily had uh, the inherent authority to just ban things, right? Uh, in 1937, when marijuana was acted against by the, by the feds, it was the Marijuana Tax Act of 1937 where they passed a prohibitive tax to try to stamp out marijuana. And they very much used the same play from the same playbook in 1934 against these so-called gangster weapons. They did not outright prohibit them. They simply passed a prohibitive making and transfer tax of $200, which, you know, if we do the uh, inflation calculator uh, arithmetic, that's something like 
four grand in today's money. So to transfer an item that costs significantly less than that, now you got to put down money that would buy you a used car just for the uh, bureaucratic privilege of having your paperwork in order. So clearly intended to prohibit these items, but not an outright prohibition the way the law reads. And so, uh, you know, for silencers and most NFA uh, items, this is going to be an effective prohibition, but really the reasoning for silencers was different. For machine guns, you know, they're talking about the Valentine's Day massacre and the rate of fire and, you know, police being outgunned. But that really wasn't the legislative rationale for silencers. Silencers uh, being part of this uh, regulatory regime really was uh, on the basis of claims uh, that, oh, they might uh, – enhance the ability of poachers, you know, illicit hunters to ply their craft, to get out and shoot Bambi off season or without a permit from the state. And boy, they might get away with it because the game warden wouldn't hear them. Uh, and what what is at the root of this misapprehension of what silencers do really boils down to the marketing. Silencer is a trade name uh, that was made up by a fellow named Hiram Percy Maxim, whose dad invented the Maxim machine gun way back when. And uh, Hiram Percy Maxim stayed in the family business. uh, And before he invented the car muffler, he invented the firearm muffler. Uh, And silencer was just Uh, you know, sort of like we say Kleenex. Boy, it sounds catchy. Uh, Boy, my nose is going to be clean. Does it really clean your nose? No, it doesn't. Well, does a silencer really silence your firearm? No, it does make it a little less obnoxiously loud. Uh, But again, really more of a a trade name, more of a marketing hype than uh, than reality. What a silencer does do is it makes uh, a silencer more hearing safe. It takes it from my head's in a jet engine loud to boy, I'm mowing the lawn and I can hear my lawnmower loud, okay? So it's still obnoxiously loud, but it's not, you know, my wife's going to have a hard time telling me what chores she needs me to do loud, uh, you know? And so that's that's the benefit. That's why the federal legislation that we see now is called the Hearing Protection Act, because really this is about making these firearms, making this type of equipment safer for the user, safer for bystanders. You know, I, I have a friend in my Sunday school class at church who's an occupational audiologist, uh, and she talks about, look, when I go into a workplace, uh, the first thing we do is not hand out personal protective equipment. That's a last resort. The first thing we do is try to make the machine safer. We try to make the workplace ambient noise level lower before we start slapping on, you know, earplugs and, you know, earmuffs and all the rest. You know, that that personal protective equipment is what we do as the last resort. And that's the philosophy here. Let's make the machine, let's make the firearm itself safer. And now if there's a bystander you're not aware of or whose hearing protection equipment isn't up to snuff, we've already protected them at the muzzle of the gun. Uh, And I think that makes good common sense. Uh, And frankly, we're already seeing development for more silencers to be built into guns in anticipation of this law uh, coming out. Uh, The distortion in the market that exists right now is, okay, boy, there's this big transactional headache when I want to get into one of these silencers. And so I just want to buy the minimum number of silencers so I can swap them between all my firearms and my collection. Uh, And Again, that's because you're paying a per silencer tax when you have one of these items transferred to you or when you make one of these items if you're the handy uh, do-it-yourselfer type. Uh, And so uh, if we can start adding them to individual firearms without having a per silencer tax, that's really the direction the market wants to push in because now you can have a specialized item that's more effective for that particular tool, uh, might not add to the overall length to the same extent, easier to clean, all the rest. And and so uh, silencer Co., sort of one of the movers and shakers in the silencer industry, just finally brought out the world's first integrally suppressed nine millimeter pistol. It's called the Maxim, uh, named in honor of the originator of the firearm silencer who we already described. Uh, And that just hit uh, the shelves just a couple of days ago. Uh, And I think that's the direction the market is likely to go in. Um, But no, it's, it's exciting times and really fixing this, this improperly hyped public policy problem that shouldn't have existed in the first place uh, that, you know, of course, really was an offshoot of another public policy mistake, alcohol prohibition. And, and I have to mention, it's not a mistake that this law was passed just a few months after the end of alcohol prohibition. The passage of the NFA was literally six months after 
uh, repeal of the Volstead Act. And you know they had this perfectly good federal bureaucracy, right? The Bureau of Prohibition that was going to be mothballed. And of course, we can't let a good bureaucracy go to waste, Tom. And so they repurposed the Bureau of Prohibition to become what we now know as the ATF or the BATFE, because they've added explosives uh, to the mix of the things that they regulate. Uh, you know, we might call them the Bureau of All Things Fun and Exciting. And, you know, you've seen the T-shirt that, hey, it ought to be a convenience store and not a federal bureaucracy. Uh, but, yeah, that's that's sort of the culture that still exists in that agency is the culture of people going out with axes to break stuff. Uh, and it's very much not a, an agency that's focused on customer service. It's focused on making people's lives harder if they're engaged in activities with their, which are within the realm of, of the regulated uh, you know, issue area. So it's, uh, it's interesting to, to think about the possibility of silencers just being uh, something you could buy over the counter instead of having to go through this multi-month approval process. The status quo under the NFA is you have to submit paperwork uh, that gets filled out at the dealer uh, you know, counter, basically, goes off to this black hole of a federal bureaucracy and disappears. And right now, the wait time is eight or nine months to see your paperwork come back. That's eight or nine months after you've paid the tax, after you've jumped through all these hoops and had your fingerprints rolled and filled out all this paperwork. And then, finally, they send back the approval uh, with the little canceled tax stamp on it to your dealer saying, hey, you can give this person his his property. And then you get that blessed phone call that day saying, hey, come get your toy. Uh, and so what the Hearing Protection Act would do is just treat silencers like other firearms. You'd still have all of the other rules that apply to acquisition of a firearm, background checks and all the rest. But it just wouldn't be this onerous, costly, burdensome uh, process that we currently have. So re- real improvement for liberty and frankly, an improvement uh, for folks uh, – everybody except for the folks who sell hearing aids. So something we can look forward to, hopefully. All right. I want to ask you something just for me. But I, again, I suspect there are probably some people who would also benefit. I want to know what I'm again. I'm look, I'm sorry, people. I don't know everything. I want to know what are tell me what black rifles are. Well, uh, you know, in our racist culture, uh, not all rifles are created equal. Uh, and some rifles that to some folks appear scarier than others get a bad rap. Uh, and so uh, that's what we jokingly refer to as black rifles. The idea that uh, some rifles just look like they're more dangerous, that just look like they're military uh, equipment and not, you know, friendly civilian hunting rifles. Uh, but really what it amounts to is modernization uh, in the manufacturing processes. The fact that it used to be that a gunsmith is a guy who's lovingly fitting, you know, handcrafted parts together and and all these parts are made to only fit with each other, you know, and this and this pistol, you know, like that Samuel Colt would have made, you can't have parts from another pistol he made. They wouldn't be interchangeable. Uh, you know, we've moved beyond that. Thank goodness, right? Eli Whitney, you know, the, uh, the idea of interchangeable parts, uh, it's finally made it uh, in a in its fullest sense, into the firearms industry. And so now we do have modularity in firearms. And a a great example of that in the modern era is the AR-15, which is sort of uh, the quintessential black rifle, if you will. And of course, it's a rifle that's very popular with a number of militaries, with police agencies. And it's, it's probably the most popular rifle among civilians in the United States right now. Uh, the ironic thing about all the hype about these black rifles is that they're actually less powerful than grandpa's deer rifle. Okay. The, in fact, the, the value proposition of these rifles is that they are lighter and less powerful and have less recoil than those heavy deer rifles that are intended to bring down big game, bring down the elk or the moose or the bear. These are rifles that it's easier to move around with, uh, that are more user friendly and they're more customizable. Uh, and, and frankly, uh, they're also more reliable than a lot of the rifles of yesteryear. Uh, and they happen to be very effective tools for defense and for sport. You know, I, I used one of these scary rifles to shoot a deer uh, in our Nebraska uh, regular firearms deer season in November. Uh, and the deer didn't know any better. Uh, she didn't know that I was shooting a, you know, a scary black rifle. She thought I was just shooting a plain old hunting rifle. And so she obliged me by falling down where, where she stood. Uh, but, you know, that, it really is more about appearances than about function. Uh, you can have two rifles where the fundamental operating principles of the machine are 
essentially identical, but because the furniture on one happens to be wooden, whereas the furniture on the other firearm is made out of black polymer, uh, you might get a very different impression from the uninformed onlooker just because of the cosmetics. And, and that's something that we're trying to push back against and trying to educate against, but be, people have to be willing to learn about something that they don't know and not just go off of talking points. And that's sort of the struggle. What are other terms that black rifles or black guns might be known to people as? Well, so when folks who don't like them are talking about them, they often refer to them as assault weapons. There you go. Uh, now, how, how do you answer that? Because the average person who's a libertarian who doesn't know all the details about guns does get hit with this, that these are – why would you defend assault weapons? And you, <laughs> you feel like saying, well, I don't know. I mean, like, I, I, I guess because I'd rather have regular people have them than the creeps who run the show. I mean, but what would be the, the good, meaty, Dick Clark-style reply to that? Well, there's a there's a kernel of etymological truth to the term, okay? And we can admit that. Actually, it was Nazi Germany who came up with that term, okay? Uh, the Sturmgewehr, the, the assault rifle. Uh, the idea was, hey, we're going to have a lighter rifle that's easier to move around with. So as opposed to being a weapon that you use in an emplaced, you know, uh, barricaded position where you're just sitting there and you can't move the thing around because it's so heavy. Now here's a weapon that you can use while you're moving. And that's why the that's why that adjective assault was tacked onto the front. The idea is this is a lighter, uh, less powerful weapon that guys who are moving around while they're engaged in whatever activity they're engaged in, they, they can carry it. They don't have to be He-Man uh, to carry it. And so literally that, that German word uh, was ported over into the English language and then used in a pejorative sense. Um, and so insofar as we're just talking about weapons that are lighter, that are less powerful, Fine, let's talk about that being a difference but between these other, you know, battle rifles that are that are more traditional for, for military use pre-World War II. Uh, so that, that's fair to point out those differences. But the but again, the modern sense when we hear assault weapon or assault rifle, uh, folks think of the crime or tort of assault where we're aggressing against somebody else. And again, that's not what they're for at all. Uh, you know, people use these weapons or these firearms every day in competition. They use them in target shooting. Um, but I'll tell you, uh, the most important thing about your right to keep and bear arms is that it enables you to defend against aggressors. And frankly, yes, these firearms are useful to defend against aggressors, and yes, even multiple aggressors. We had a young man here in Lincoln, Nebraska, just a few years ago, and I'll tell you, Lincoln's a very safe place. I mean, usually you can count on your two hands the number of murders that happen in Lincoln, Nebraska, which is almost population 300,000, so a very safe place. Uh, you know, over a given year, usually less than 10 murders, uh, but we had a guy uh, just a few years ago on the 4th of July. He's driving home. Kid runs out into the street, actually runs into the side of his car as he's driving by. So he doesn't hit the kid. The kid bumps into him. He doesn't even realize it. He thought he hit a firework in the street or something. So he keeps driving. Kid is uninjured. But the child's father was furious, thought that this guy had hit and run his child. And so this guy goes to the driver's house, follows him with some friends, with guns. Three armed assailants show up at this guy's house, young man in his 20s. Uh, and they came there with the intent to kill him. And this young man, who happened to be black, had uh, a civilian semi-automatic only variant of the AK-47 rifle. And he had that in his house. And he was able to defend his life against these men with murderous intent on his doorstep. And it wasn't a fair fight. There were three men there to do him harm. And because he had a rifle that was user-friendly, that used a less powerful non, you know, mostly we think of a non-hunting round uh, that has less recoil. He was able to save his own life and legally act to defend himself. And that's a piece of technology that people ought to have access to because bad guys don't fight fair. And, and good guys ought to have every advantage that they can. And that's what these rifles do for us. So it is important to fight for, for these rifles, not just for all the sporting uses, which are the predominant use, but because it makes it more possible for a defender to defend his home. All right. Wow. Man, you are a much better guest than I thought. <laughs> and, and, <laughs> there's no way for that not to sound wrong. But uh, uh, wow, I, I just I didn't know we never really talked about this stuff all that much. Uh, although I guess I remember you kind of nudging me to go out shooting with you. Right. <laughs> Well, you know, I'm a, I'm a proselytizing gun nerd, I guess you could say. And yeah, uh, well, we need that kind. Absolutely, most pe most gun people seem to be that kind. I find. 
<laughs> well, you know, I we enjoy it as a sport. You know, I my dad was a gun owner. He wasn't a hunter, uh, but he was a gun owner. And I really learned to shoot in the Boy Scouts and later taught rifle shooting and shotgun shooting merit badges and archery merit badge in the Boy Scouts. And I'm, I'm a true believer that I'm safer when good guys have guns and know how to safely employ them, know how to safely use them, know how to safely not use them, you know, keep your finger off the trigger till you're ready to shoot. Don't point a gun at anybody that you, you know, that you don't have a right to shoot. But always keep that gun pointed in a safe direction. I, I want there to be more knowledge about guns, not less, because I think that makes my kids safer, not just from aggressors, but from accidents. Uh, you know, we have more guns in this country than we have people. And it's just ludicrous to think that we wouldn't take every opportunity to teach people whether they're going to become a hobbyist, whether they're going to become a conscientious gun owner or not. Uh, they need to understand gun safely, just uh, gun safety, just like they need to understand car safety, because these are things that are going to be around. They're machines they're going to encounter in American society. And let's make it safer. Uh, there, there's no reason in the world to have more hazard associated with these tools. Well, the website, if you'd like to visit Dick, is dickclarklaw.com or silencerlawyer.com. So you came up with that? Oh, yeah. I just, you know, snatched up a bunch of uh, seemly sounding domain names, and that was one of them. <laughs> I always love when I'm pleasantly surprised that a domain name, a .com, is still available. Right. One, one that really, by rights, should not have been available to me. I mean, learnaustrianeconomics.com, I could not believe that was available. And then my favorite, supportinglisteners.com. <laughs> that's that's such a good site that everybody assumes that's a general site that you go to to support different causes you like. Nope, it's just for me. <laughs> it's just mine. <laughs> it was there, and I grabbed it. I was salivating with my 10 smackers that I put down for that. So, yeah, <laughs> silencerlawyer.com is worth more than you paid for it, I bet. That is, that's really so. terrific. Yeah. Well, it's the new race to homestead, uh, homestead uh, valuable property that's out there, right? Uh, it's not covered wagons. It's sitting at the keyboard. So. Yeah, yeah, you're right. Yeah, that's <laughs> That's a whole episode in itself. All right. Well, thanks so much, Dick. Uh, we'll have to talk to you again soon. Thanks for having me on, Tom. All right. That's going to do it for another episode of The Tom Woods Show. If you're enjoying and profiting from the show, then join the elite as a supporting listener over at supportinglisteners.com. I'll see you tomorrow. Become a smarter libertarian in just 30 minutes a day. Visit tomwoods.com to subscribe to the show for free, and we'll see you next time. <laughs>